good evening everyone and on behalf of the rohini nilakani philanthropies welcome to our last session for the day in the resilient society society track it's called lift kara de the aim of the session is to peep into the thinking that drives funders in this space as well as to understand the objectives and aspirations behind funding citizenship what spurs and limits certain types of funding from taking place what have been the challenges and learnings how can more funding be catalyzed for the sector these are some of the themes that we will be exploring Before we begin, a few housekeeping rules for the audience. There are two windows or tabs to your right: the chat window for conversation on topics being discussed. We encourage you to let us know your thoughts throughout the session, and a Q and A window for asking any questions that you may have. Ask your questions throughout the session, and note that the questions can be upvoted as well. We hope to run the session for 50 minutes, and in the last 10 minutes, we will try to answer the most upvoted questions by directing them towards the speaker. With that, let me hand hand this over to Tarun Cherupuri, co-founder and CEO of Indus Action, to introduce our speakers and take this session forward. Over to you, Tarun. Thank you, Yash. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Tarun from Indus Action, like Yash said. Uh, to get us started, uh, I'll quote Aaron Sorkin from West Wing, uh, where he famously said, "Decisions in a democracy are taken by people who decide to show up." Um, so that's really apt for today's discussion. Uh, we'll deep dive into funders' perspective on the practice of active citizenship, uh, a key enabling factor to actually make that happen, mobilize more citizens to uh, show up in the public sphere. Uh, we have a really strong panel to enable this discussion. Uh, we have three uh, represent senior leadership from three pioneering foundations uh, in the space of active citizenship: Natasha Joshi from uh, Romanian Electricity Philanthropies. Uh, Samir Shishodia from the Inmatter Foundation and Bharat Pandey from uh, Omidya Network Investments. Uh, all three who have kind of led the way by investing philanthropic risk capital in not just active citizenship but uh, fledgling and underserved fields like digital societies, gender equity, and climate resilience. Um, with that, uh, first of all, uh, we'll start with a short poll uh, to understand what all of you would love to hear uh, from our three speakers. Uh, Yash, if you could help me with the short poll. So we have four themes for today uh, that we'd focus the discussion on. So we'd like to hear uh, what you would like to hear. Uh, the first theme on growing the pie of funds for active citizenship. Uh, the second theme, exploring the funder-founder uh, power dynamics. The session before this was focused on founders, uh, and this will focus on funders. Uh, so we'd like to kind of uh, uh, dwell into the dynamics between the both. Uh, thirdly, the levers of impact uh, in active citizenship space, technology. Measuring success, ecosystem partnerships, and the final theme: How do we imagine India at 100 uh, in 2047, uh, especially in the realm of uh, active citizenship? Take thirty seconds more to thank you, everyone. Uh, we'll we'll pause the voting there. Yes, is it possible to show uh, kind of the percentages once again, very quickly? So uh, we have majority of you interested in increasing the pie for active citizenship. Uh, the next, uh, in terms of talking about future of active citizenship, when India turns 100 in 2047, uh, interestingly, uh, no interest for funder-founder power dynamics. Uh, so maybe like if we have some space, uh, we'll, we'll try and squeeze that in as well. Um, but having said that, uh, I'll turn this over to the speakers now uh, to give their opening remarks. Um, for those of you interested in their profiles, uh, their uh, brief bios are in the chat window uh, for you to read more. Um, we'll go in alphabetical order, so I'll open the floor to Natasha for her opening remarks. Sure. Thanks, Tarun. Um, and this is actually a conversation that we've had many times internally, and it's really lovely to have this externally as well. 
um, for at Rohini Nilikani Philanthropies, our work in active citizenship is something that we call as a portfolio, but it's really such a horizontal and it kind of overlaps with all of our other portfolios that it's difficult to sort of give it a very clear contour of what falls under civil society, what fa falls under citizenship, what falls under justice, because all of these things are in inextricably linked. But I think that, you know, the genesis naturally of a lot of the work comes from this faith in sort of Samaj being the first sector, Samaj being the sort of container within which all of the other interactions between the players um, happen. And therefore, you know, the voice, platforming the voice of citizens, platforming um, the interactions between citizens is something that we feel very passionately about. Um, at the same time, I think it's also a very um, hard to define category of work because many times when we talk about citizen itself as a word can be unpacked in many, many different ways, sometimes um, excitingly, sometimes problematically. So, you know, we have to contend with many of these ideas. And I think that we're uh, very excited to do this in a co-creative manner rather than to just sort of think of it entirely on our own. So I'm just sort of going to keep that short because I'm actually quite excited to talk to all three of you um, and, and dialogue a lot more than just sort of uh, <laughs> share my own thinking. So I'd love to pass this on to, um, to Samir perhaps. Hey, thanks, Natasha. So I think I think um, you uh, said it uh, absolutely right. Uh, it's very difficult to uh, disengage uh, citizen citizenship, citizenry from any aspect of any of the work we're doing. Right. In fact, uh, a major focus, if you if you have to uh, try and solve climate change, and that's that's our focus as a foundation. Uh, we are fairly uh, new to this. We do not have that much. Uh, uh, experience in the uh, civil society space, but we just looked at it as a bunch of uh, problems that needed to be solved. And you just cannot keep the citizen out of it, right? You cannot keep solving in silos. So um, uh, unless unless a lot of these ideas, solutions, attempts go mainstream, I don't think we're solving any of this. So in fact, I would turn it around and say, you know, that that's at the root of everything that we need to solve. So that's how we're looking at it. Uh, Thank you, Samir. Do you want to yeah. come in? Okay, sure. No, great to be here. Thanks, Tarun. Thanks, Samir and Natasha and uh, RNP for organizing this session. Uh, if you give me a couple of minutes, I actually just wanted to clear up a few thoughts um, around, um, you know, maybe um, anchor this discussion a little bit in the historical part. Because I think if you think about the head, especially India at 47, I think it's useful to. Um, useful to learn from the past just a little bit and I've been fortunate to have seen this issue closely both within government uh, as a development practitioner and as uh, a philanthropic organization that has been engaging in governance and citizen engagement for about 10 years in India. So you know the first interesting thing in my view is that civic engagement uh, active citizenship was a constitutional problem uh, and you know those of us who see that the constitutional debates the whole issue of Panchayati Raj was very, very uh, core to it. Where the founding fathers landed there was to say it will be a directive principle of state policy. Essentially meant it's not a justiciable uh, part of the constitution, but it's an aspiration for the new uh, state. And then as many of you know, in 1992, when we got the 73rd, 74th amendment to the constitution, we were able to activate uh, these, uh, both the urban and the rural aspects of um, civic engagement by instituting a three-tier system of government, of local governance, by ensuring that the Gram Sabha, at least in Perry, is really going to be the heart of all um, decision-making, bottom-up decision-making by citizens, and by devolving funds, to, uh, devolving function to the PRI, Panchayati Raj Institution, and the ULB, the urban local body. Now, what happened there, right? Uh, I think an uh, interesting learning for us from the experience is that when you think about active citizenship bottom-up, there are three F's. There's functions, there's functionaries, and there are funds. Now, what the 73rd and 74th Amendment did really well was to devolve function to the local bodies. However, I would I would argue that they uh, largely failed in the other two F's, which is devolving functionaries, the people who are supposed to deliver services, their accountability to, to citizens, 
and even more importantly and relevant to this public conversation funds we all know the state of our uh, uh, open local bodies and panchayats in terms of their own sources of funding their lack of discretionary powers in making funding decisions and to be honest i think uh, many of these um, organ uh, institutions at the grassroots have become more glorified implementers of top down agendas so i think uh, it's fact number 1 i think the constitution gave us a uh, civic engagement budget including the funding for it we haven't been able to the second um, vignette i would say is civic engagement through community mobilization which has been the other big thing in the last 30 40 years in our country uh, we've had the cooperative movement mixed bag lots to uh, lots uh, lots of people have lots of views on it the one uh, movement i have closely observed and i wanted to tee up uh, for this discussion is the with the women self help group movement because i think that's uh, almost in my view a silent revolution over the last 20 years in this country uh, in more than 80 million women in rural india are part of uh, women self help groups i had the privilege of seeing them from close quarters seeing the before and after effect and many of you may have also seen it i think the incredible uh, thing here has been that it has tried to address the issue of civic empowerment at three levels the first is the very basic which is saving and thrift followed by a low cost credit for basic livelihood activities the second um, is around taking ownership of uh, service delivery in their local context so the well functioning sgs are, have been doing everything from local procurement of agriculture to running pds shops and so on and so forth and of course the highest level effect is the empowerment effect the confidence the passion the belief that comes if you are part of a effective sg the magic in my view of the sg movement has been the federated structure which is to say there will be a support system to these grassroots community organizations and at every higher level the complexity will will go up right so while the while the basic ownership is with the unit of the self help group they have provided the support structure to actually become successful whether it's market linkages whether it's access to technology whether it is um you know coordination with the state machinery and so on and so forth and i think that is a really interesting learning as you think about funding citizen engagement that identifying the right leverage points for that funding is very important and i would argue the sg movement is an is an exemplar in the indian context for that uh, for that purpose and lastly i think the third example i would give are community mobilization and uh, civic engagement through special purpose missions which have happened in our country we're all familiar with the swachh bharat mission uh, got a lot of publicity over the last 5 years but an interesting precursor to the swachh bharat mission was a program that um, some of you may have heard of called the nirmal gram puraskar and the idea here was that um, we let the community take ownership to make the village open defecation free and if it does achieve that uh, that uh, that um, that task then a financial reward will be given to the village to invest in a public work of their choice and so the interesting thing here was a conditional outcome based um uh, incentive which was given to the community to come together and i think there uh, and there have been there were many studies around the nirmal gram puraskar back in 2011 to 2014 which suggested that you know this was an interesting uh, concept and so the fact number 3 for me was when we think about funding citizen engagement and active citizenship finding the right mechanism to overcome the collective action problem which is endemic when we talk about uh, civic engagement is really critical and funding can play an important role in this so i just wanted to start tarun by placing these three i would say historical examples of active citizenship one starting with the constitution itself which has uh, which tried to do this community mobilization through the self help group movement and then special purpose um, efforts such as swachh bharat and the nirmal gram puraskar which are giving us some really interesting learnings from the past on the role of funding and how uh, and where to deploy it over to you thank you thank you varad for uh, kind of setting up this discussion in the historical context and uh, ms samir and natasha as well for uh, kind of adding texture to kind of the definition of the space itself uh, i think uh, you know one thing that comes to mind is uh, you know building on what all three of you said Uh, is the size of the space itself uh, like what kind of uh, you know extended the definition to uh, include sgs and uh, you know special purpose missions as well um, uh, i kind of read benchmarking of the number of public servants involved in india 
relative to other countries. And what I picked up was that uh, we're right now, even if we include, uh, you know, PSU employees, uh, and I'm not sure if SDGs are included in this calculation, uh, but it amounts to about three and a half to four uh, percent of our entire capita uh, that is involved in public serving roles uh, as part of the government, uh, benchmark with kind of Western countries and developed countries. So uh, they are at about 12 to 15 percent. Um, so we don't have accurate stats on uh, number of active citizens or number of kind of active civil society organizations and SAGs. Um, uh, but kind of rough estimates indicate that, uh, you know, uh, probably it amounts to one, two CR. Uh, up and above the four CR public servants. Uh, so clearly, like there is an order of you know three to four times, uh, I guess, uh, under commitment of resources at the level of either functionaries uh, or at the level of you know broad size of the participation itself. Uh, so I'm I'm curious to learn how uh, you're thinking about leverage uh, from kind of each of your foundational vantage points. Uh, you know, how do we grow the size of this pie? How do we uh, bring, of course, more funds uh, into kind of high leverage spaces uh, like? were it listed out um, and, and deriving from the funds, like, you know, how do we motivate uh, kind of increased number of functionaries, uh, both from civil society, but also how we motivate the state to spend more uh, on, you know, some of these, uh, you know, high leverage uh, uh, initiatives. Uh, I'll, I'll open the floor. Any of you can get us started. But I'd like all of you to kind of share your views on this question. Um. Uh, Okay, go ahead, Samir. Yeah. So actually, uh, Varad, thanks a lot. You provided a nice framework for uh, bringing out a lot of points that uh, we've been thinking about. Uh, we've obviously not, uh, we've been thinking about everything from a very strong climate lens, obviously. Uh, and uh, for us, uh, it's, it's, not a, it's not a function of choice because uh, I don't think, like I said earlier, I don't think we can uh, solve this problem by uh, just the government or a few people focusing on it or a few you know, so for for us, for us, it's a problem that's to be solved multidimensionally across sectors, across whatever whatever people are doing. It doesn't matter if they're self solving healthcare or education; they have to account for the ecology. Otherwise, um, it's a it's going to be a short lived solution. Let me just put it very bluntly like that, right? And and uh, this again has to find adoption uh, ground up, right? Right from the large base of citizenry in any bioregion that you're trying to address this in. Um, to the institutions and the markets there, right? So there's a, there's a whole, like you said, there's a hierarchy of players, not just in the SHGs and not just in in government, but but in society as a whole. So, like Samaj itself is a, a complex beast, right? Like, and it uh, actually subsumes pretty much everything else we do. So uh, the the belief around some of these ideas, the recognition of especially the uh, nth order problems that arise out of it, because the benefits are also you know, the, 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 we are starting to the nth order problems are starting to become a very here and now thing right now, as far as climate is concerned. But the benefits are still nth order, and it's a it's a complex one to message, right? I think I think collective action fails there, you know, because because the uh, impact from it is not always immediate, and we have we've seen it in multiple uh, partners that we have tried to, uh, you know, we 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 try to understand if. If so much effort has gone into it, if so many experiments have happened, why hasn't it added up to something? And as part of this, this is something that we learned from their experiences that unless unless there's a grounding in society, unless there's a grounding in what people believe, what people understand, uh, I don't think I don't think we're going to make progress. So functionaries for us start from that large citizen citizen yeah. to people who are trying to solve that problem at. Uh, whether institutionally or as or as entrepreneurs, you know, so, so it'll it'll need multiple people to play these roles. Uh, the functions have to cut across, uh, at, at least from a climate lens, they they just have to cut across, uh, you know, uh, uh, civil society functions, government roles, uh, market roles, all of that. So we we can't we can't cherry pick this. We can't solve the problem in one little domain and expect it to not get uh, sucked back into, you know, uh, the older normal, as it were. That's, that's the phrase people use a lot. The funds are available. Uh, I think philanthropy can go a certain way to unlock. You know, once once a large set of citizens believe something in a, in a, in a specific area, things tend to happen. Whether we, we've seen instances where people have pitched in their own money to uh, 
uh, replant man, you know, mangroves that got destroyed because they realized that their survival is linked to it. Even if funding, even if uh, government funding or, or philanthropic funding uh, did not appear for that. So I think I think funds are not the big problem. They can they can you can you can use it to, to unlock certain uh, behaviors and whatever uh, and you know larger government funding, larger institutional funding. But uh, the, I think the messaging change, uh, trying to understand the benefit that comes from collective action, etc., is a very very big missing piece. Natasha, sorry, I sure, no, that's you. fine. Actually, um, it's really interesting. I think. Uh, there is something I wanted to pick up from what Bharat said, and then there's something that Samiru said really struck me. So I, I think the women's SAG movement is a really interesting example of locating uh, a solution, so to speak, within the social cultural realities of the people who ha who are part of that solution. And that's one of the big things uh, that I, I think one has to be very cognizant of is that even if you're looking at any individual or groups of individuals and whether you are looking to empower them or whether you are looking to have them express their voices first is having a really strong sense of their lived realities becomes vital you know to sort of understanding what it is they need what it is that they can do what are their uh, and of course many times we kind of approach you know there is a tendency to sort of look at especially marginalized groups with a sort of deficit lens right what is it they don't have but then there are many aspects um from which they can draw strength. And I think having a much better understanding of that is also really important. And I think I will be the first person to say that a lot of us may not have that. Uh, and so like developing better tools for listening and seeing some of those realities becomes really important. Um, and, 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 and so that's, that's one. The other thing is, you know, uh, on missions, I think I really like this point because, um, uh, I, I, I used to work in education. I've worked there for a decade. And I think Sarva Shiksha Abhyan is also a great example of sort of, you know, something that went to mission scale after it started as a sort of DFID, DPEP program uh, in the kind of pre-mission stage. And even before that, all of the cluster level work was something that was much more grassroots and ground up that came from departments and came from talukas on their own. So I think the question for us, and this is a really interesting question to ponder, is really that what is the arc of... Um, a solution or a movement what is the arc of anything and at what point does it become manifest versus at what point is it latently being nourished and brewing and so for us i think one of the areas that we we always sort of try to understand is that you know what what is it that we can do at this point in time that will manifest let's say 10 years later or 20 years later <laughs> with 20 years, I know it's quite long, uh, especially on the climate thing. I think we need a much greater urgency. But but even even so, I think where we are trying to understand is what is the role of being able to demystify movements when they are embryonic coming in at that point in time. And so so in that regard, I think from a funding lens, in citizenship especially or civic engagement, um, I think we're really excited about actions. Like for us, actions are the outcomes action taking initiative taking whether it is uh, you know at the unit level so whether that unit is an individual or that unit is an organization or the unit is a coalition of volunteers whatever it is um just the very act of doing something um is is exciting and i think um of course it there has to what what is valuable through conversations like the ones we're having is to sort of share ideas on how different people come with different lenses on understanding actions and then how those actions can be coalesce into a greater whole and get greater momentum and smaller coalitions can build into larger. And eventually, like I said, the movement or the solution emerges uh, as opposed to sort of us knowing that upfront. So that's some of the kind of reflections I had on what both Samir and Bharat said. Um, and yeah, I'd like to sort of uh, hear, hear more from you as well, Tarun. Uh, Tarun, can you hear me? Because there was a comment around, uh, I was not very audible. Uh, yeah, so if you could be closer to the mic, perhaps okay. so it's in and out. So, yeah, yeah. I'll try that, yeah. yeah. Now, I'll just pick up from where Natasha left on the this word demystify. I think the, I mean, I was thinking of this, and I think one of the challenges with active citizenship is the fact that the topic itself can seem a little esoteric and abstract and not as compelling as direct causes like education and health, where you can see people's lives hopefully change in, in some very direct kind of way. So I think the, you know, to me, the need to make, uh, make the case or make the social impact case in a compelling way is uh, hard in this space, but also um, an area where we need to give a lot more thought. 
uh, one of course is the standard uh, technique of can we quantify uh, the value uh, in a way that is uh, that is useful and one of the things we do for example in our in our portfolio to media network india we try and measure the or uh, at least capture the um, policy impact uh, that the uh, that uh, the partner organization or investor has created uh, so for example janagraha uh, and the foundation for ecological security who are both our grantees investees uh, they track very very nicely the kind of progress they have made on their agendas and so we try and put it in a framework and you know for ourselves and then aggregate it and use that to sort of you know fully grow the tribe in some way around around those issues the second of course is the idea of um, telling better stories of impact i think uh, and samir will relate to this the climate change which i hope is now finally at a tipping point in terms of both community interest and funding interest has benefited from the whole uh, making it real uh, piece you know starting from algor's documentary to various efforts since then and that if anything that has been far more powerful than ipcc reports in making the case for climate change so telling better stories i think is sort of the second second takeaway uh, and then i think the third is i mean i, I really believe that um, you know outside funders can only do so much we really the real leverage points are one the community the second is the government right and we need to figure out ways of unlocking those in a more effective way i think you know finding the catalytic leverage points of government funding and figuring out how to make that uh, happen in the interest of active citizenship is really important i'll give you one example which is there's an organization called i forest which has recently been set up one of the very interesting things they are working on is how do you create collective action among communities who are living in tribal areas to help unlock uh, what are called district mineral funds which are large pools of money which are lying with districts which are in the tribal belt where mining happens um, and, and so on so you have large pool of government money which is not being unlocked and they are trying to solve the problem how through community action we can unlock that money which is meant to be for for communities so i think finding that catalytic leverage point to unlock government resources is a huge underutilized lever as well that we should all try and uh, help um, with thank you thank you all uh, i just want to kind of uh, you know add a bit of my uh, experience as well uh, i think largely building on you know the themes you had listed uh, so one i agree with uh, you know samir that i think once you are able to demonstrate a critical mass of uh, you know active citizen participation so hopefully you know resources do follow and that's been kind of our experience uh, you know trying to mobilize uh, uh, resources for implementation of uh, right to education and uh, maternity benefits and the right to food um and uh, to natasha's point uh, uh, you know uh, in fact we at several points in kind of our journey in the last 8 years uh, we had uh, learned how uh, you know wrong we were with our hypothesis and our assumptions of you know household behaviors uh, which kind of fundamentally shifted uh, you know how we organized our school readiness program or even our ration delivery program so in the last 18 months uh, one of the significant insights have been how kind of distribution of ration happens in a household uh and uh, one of the key uh, learnings was that uh, you know uh, we we assume that rations delivered to pregnant lactating mothers and uh, uh, children are largely consumed by the intended beneficiaries uh, but uh, we quickly realized that that was not the case because of livelihood shocks uh, and uh, our program could not just focus on education and maternal health and had to address the livelihood shocks in the context of the pandemic uh you know speaking to natasha's point on uh, really going in with uh, a lens of kind of deep listening uh, and not making assumptions about norms that drive kind of impact and kind of behavior uh, in the last mile and uh, you know, finally to varit's point uh, there have been many times where uh, we try to advocate uh, for policy uh, impact you know based on the uh, kind of our understanding of data from uh, a citizenship space um but many times the leverage has been making the same case from the perspective of uh the benefits for government officials uh just to cite a quick example like we were making a case for online lotteries for rt admissions and for for a large uh, you know point of time we would advocate for the benefits uh, that you know families stood to gain in terms of reduced uh, transaction costs uh, but what really clinched the case was actually when we were able to make the case for increased uh, 
uh, you know, person hours for government officials who were otherwise to invigilate these lotteries. Uh, when we made that case that you know school principals and vice principals would be saved huge amounts of time if we were to kind of make this algorithm online, fair and open. Uh, that was when things went online. So, uh, so yeah, uh, I definitely resonate with uh, you know uh, all the three points you had mentioned. Uh, so before we move to kind of uh, the questions from the audience, uh, so I wanted to kind of pick on the second topic, uh, which is kind of, you know, how do you see the space uh, from a long-term point of view? Mantasha started off with making investments with a decadal horizon. So if you were to extend that and, you know, uh, give us ourselves the 25-year horizon, uh, so, you know, what is the imagination uh, from each of your foundations for, you know, India at 100? We're not going alphabetical this time, Tarun. <laughs> oh, you want Varad, to get started? Varad has the most experience in this. So <laughs> I'm going to let him start. Well, I can tell you my uh, aspiration. I don't know whether it's an organizational aspiration. But I think the, um, the fundamental belief in the power of active citizenship has to be, I would even use the word restored. Because again, I go back to the fact that our founding fathers, 100, uh, it'll be, since we're saying India at 100, had really thought of this topic as a, uh, as something which was foundational to the idea of India. And I think it will only happen if we, you know, uh, people in this meeting, but also obviously much more broadly, keep innovating and, and figuring out how uh, to, 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 you know, re reframe, reimagine that, that promise. I think on the government side, I think as we discussed, there's a lot to be done on really making Panchayati Raj and urban local bodies function the way they were meant to and as far as scale goes there's no bigger uh, there's no bigger opportunity right because you uh, you know in terms of representation you have lacks of elected representatives in these bodies across the country with with um, good representation of uh, women marginalized groups etc cetera, etc cetera. so it's a question of activating it and so i think we need a pri and ulb 2.2 agenda uh, on that front i think we also need to learn from uh, the success, successful uh, models of the last few decades. And again, I, I mentioned the SSG one because I've seen it closely. I think there are a lot of interesting ways to think about, uh, think about it. And I think the main thing really is that if we all, um, you know, the community has to be at the center of this movement. And if, if the entire effort from all sides is about how do we ensure that they remain in the driving seat and have the requisite uh, tools to make those decisions, then I think we can get the flywheel effect to, to continue moving. And the more we can um, amplify the stories of uh, success and learnings uh, of, uh, in the, in the um, you know, islands of excellence that we have, ha we have had in India, the better chance uh, that we have. So I think short answer, the, the at big scale agenda is PRI and ULB 2.0. And then I think there are very large movements from which we can also learn uh, how to make the community a sustainable anchor for this uh, for this uh, process. I wanted to sort of just add a little bit um, around the government piece, you know, sort of before answering your question, Tarun, because um, I think it's a really fascinating. It's a, it's a fascinating, it's a wicked problem to sort of think about in terms of what creates these overturn windows and when does government really come into play and when does it act and how and therefore how do you leverage them or how do you create all of that so that you can leverage government and its scale. Some of the work that we've done at a very early stage really looks at this idea of, you know, who are the coalition of actors that create public sentiment that eventually also sort of drives and moves public policy. Um, and, and part of that, you know, to, to what Bharat was also saying, evidence is a really big part of that. When there is some amount of, you know, technical expertise that pushes up certain amount of evidence and solutions in the form of evidence. And when they come meet and marry with advocates, whether in the form of media who can take those solutions um, outwards or insiders within government or within, you know, areas that need, um, that are actually the impediment to that progress. So getting a set of insiders, getting a set of media and adv advocates outside, getting networks and coalitions to sort of take that as a horizontal, that uh, piece of evidence as a horizontal. Eventually, it somehow tends to kind of move government a little bit. But I think that because I'm not at all trying to, I don't want to be understood as saying that there is a formula to this. I think it's 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 a uh, it's difficult, but but I did want to share that because it's something we have thought about, and and you know again, Varad, offline it would be really lovely to maybe talk a little bit more about that. Um, 
but to your point on you know what is the what lies in the future or what would be we at least at the phila- at N- rohini nilakani philanthropies hope for um i think really for us everything is about choice and expanding the capability set as well as the choice set that is available to individuals um how we do that again is a non linear uneven process but i think that to be able to enable people to exercise agency exercise voice uh, create those conditions for for all of that i think is where we are sort of trying to root our work and and see what contribution we can have in that space and we have the faith that if that happens you know if if that kind of agency and choice fructifies then that the kind of um, spontaneous and organic byproduct of that will be a good society it will be citizens who uh, are able to operate with resilience and and have empathy and sort of care for one another and so on and so forth so that's some that's where we're hoping to <laughs> to go sami uh yeah so i'm going to actually uh, touch upon a lot of points that uh, you guys have been talking about um uh, because on on the time scale tarun i you know we have a very stark um choice on what we have picked up we don't have more than 10 years end of story right there, there are no 25 years the 25 year plan looks like a big party because if we don't solve it in 25 years we might as well blow it up you know that's that's the stark reality and uh, none, none of the other problems that we talk about will exist if if we don't if we don't figure this out in 10 years right it's it's that that was the starting point uh, that led to the found, you know creation of this foundation individually me and a lot of people on the team actually really believe this we are not we are not just kidding about this um why it needs to and, and because you have so little time you cannot you know you, can, you can't pussy foot around it you can't work at the edges you can't work at the fringes it better it better really 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 quickly become everybody's problem right which means it has to be solved by everybody simultaneously right it doesn't matter you know, what what you're fixing if you're not if you if you're fixing farmers incomes and livelihoods without accounting for the ecology you are you are dead in water 5 years from now you're going to run out of ground water you, you already have dead soils you know you have uh, you see what the rats are doing in australia i mean it's um, so honestly yes al gore did a good movie but what's happening in life now you know the new the news is far scarier than that you know so the messaging is starting to on the on the downsides is starting to turn now the messaging on the hope on what's possible what are the what are the little successes what are the ide- ideas stories methods from the last few decades how do you how do you create playbooks how do you replicate it how do you get everybody to be a change maker as quickly as possible right fundamental to that is what i mentioned earlier about people being able to see the the third fourth 27th order impact of of the change they make because that's something that's seriously seriously difficult as human beings we are almost wired to not recognize anything beyond you know in in seriously intellectual cases maybe the second order impact of things right it just eludes us as governments we cannot see that as as individuals we cannot see that so those are the outstanding problems but finally it has to be like a forest of ideas what what works in kool is not going to work in meghalaya is not going to work in chatisgarh you know there have to, there has to be local adapt, adaptation and adoption of ideas there have to be uh, you know a thousand different ideas working on it you have to allow for evolution which means you cannot go in with top down approaches and this is something we are fundamentally asking everybody we are working with when when i say working with i don't necessarily mean funding because we are also trying to create a network of collaborations you know sometimes uh, just just like a timely uh, connect between two things is all you need to solve a problem so so it's 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 not it's not optional for us to look at it as a community up view right and that involves uh, you know everybody in a village it it involves the panchayat it involves the elected reps it it involves policy it involves every, you know everybody out there so uh if it if this doesn't happen and this doesn't happen quickly enough right um you know we are we are looking at a very 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 serious situation in 5 years from now i don't think i don't think we have the luxury to look at it any any differently so yeah what can we do uh, so by the way the women's self help group has come up everywhere i think that's the best quickest most uh, 
powerful way of creating change everywhere. And this is something we just heard from everybody and we're convinced about as well. So this is, uh, it's, it's really nice. We, are, you know, we have a few points of consensus and a few goals, but I wish we had these goals economically, ecologically, you know, how do you, uh, there, are, there are certain things we cannot yet mention in public, right? We, we cannot mention the idea of degrowth, for instance. So you have to pussyfoot around it and, you know, call it localization and, and talk about different things. We, we do not we do not realize the costs that go with it. We, 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 we count the costs on the uh, on the negative side, but we do not count count the costs on the positive sides. Right. So uh, the, the math is broken. The messaging is broken. And we really, really need a lot of solutions coming on it uh, on all of these ground up, not not just thought through in Bangalore and then uh, translated poorly uh, into local local context. And, and you know, they, they never translate well. Is something we have also found. So, sorry, I was a little all over the map, but but I hope I'm able to communicate the urgency of this. And you know, we, we just cannot do this without serious civic engagement. Not not civic engagement. We cannot do this without people owning this as their own problem. It's it's not our solutions. It's not we we can merely be enablers to this. And I, and I think the sooner we realize this the more sustainable the problem solutions will be. So, yeah. Thank you, Samir, uh, uh, for, you know, closing that round on a, you know, really passionate, uh, you know, plea for uh, the urgency with which we need to act on climate resilience uh, and, uh, you know, especially how the clock is ticking. Um, so we could use the last, you know, 10, 15 minutes for the questions that have come up from our audience. Um, so I'll take uh, you know one by one and uh, direct them to one of you uh, you know based on uh, you know my understanding of who would be best suited to answer. But please feel free to chip in. Uh, the first question is from Nikhil. Uh, his question is: uh, Do you see a glass ceiling for uh, the active citizenship work uh, that is grounded or driven by Bazaar? Uh, so in terms of philanthropic investment by funders, um, what's the role of Sarkar, especially if you know, regulatory pressures? Uh, as we see with FCRA, uh, you know, change of rules, uh, will that kind of, uh, you know, have a uh, uh, kind of constraining effect on the space itself? Um, why don't you want to take a shot at it, given your understanding of uh, interaction with government? How could civil yeah. society actors build more trust uh, in in the current regulatory environment? What could we do to uh, create more enabling conditions uh, in the regulatory environment? Yeah, look, my view on this is that. Um... You know, one thing which I said earlier, which is, um, you know, our goal should be to uh, strengthen the community organizations, right? And then the flywheel effect will will happen. There's an interesting framework on this, you know, where you can argue that there is there are two routes to accountability to citizens that a state has. There's a long route, which is through elections, and then you have elected representatives, and then you serve the interests of people. And then there's a short route, which is getting the uh, service delivery functionary is to be directly accountable to people, right? So I think a lot of our effort can be focused on the short route to accountability. The other thing I would just say is that, um, you know, there are many avenues uh, of collaboration with government on this agenda. We should not assume an adversarial relationship on this agenda because I think there's a lot of unlock which can happen, right? We talked about the Panchayati Raj a few times today. Uh, that I think is the biggest at scale intervention for active and that is fully, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a national agenda uh, and we need to keep supporting it. Uh, the second, we talked about examples like the district mineral fund, which again is a government agenda, tons of money uh, around it. Uh, we need to help unlock it. Um, and then the third, I will give you another example, which is, you know, and this probably links to another question in the chat, which is, um, Putting information data out there uh, can also be done with government partnership. One of the things we are doing as an organization uh, right now is supporting the setup of something called a national data analytics platform, which is being anchored by the Niti Aayog. The idea is that you know the government produces tons of data across ministries, across states, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Technically, a lot of that is meant to be in the public domain. But currently, it lies in silos and Excel sheets and so on and so forth. So it's not particularly useful if you want to uh, either uh, inform policy making or even just bring transparency and accountability out there, right? So the effort is to try and put it 
put all that data in a common data schema on a common platform so that it's available to informed citizens, researchers, journalists, etc., to, uh, to, to provide that transparency and drive uh, citizen-centric actions. Now, again, that is another example where uh, it is uh, in, it's a public-private philanthropic partnership where this is being done uh, through, uh, through a collaboration of not just us, but many other uh, experts outside uh, and inside government. So I think, uh, you know, I just wanted to emphasize that there are lots of spaces and real examples of where uh, governments can be an active partner, collaborator in the active citizenship agenda. And we are, we are still only scratching the surface as far as that is concerned. Thank you, Bharat. Uh, I echo with you on that. And uh, you know, that's been our experience, you know, trying to work as a bridge between you know, citizens trying to access their rights and you know governments you know trying to build capacity to deliver rights in the space of education food security and livelihoods um uh, very much uh, resonate with what you shared uh, natasha do you want to add any examples from rmp portfolio especially on providing access to timely public information which has kind of led to stronger civic engagement yeah um I mean, one of course is the work that you talked about, Tarun, uh, your own work. But I think we've we have organizations like Civis, for instance, which has been working in in trying to uh, get much more participation from citizens in and giving them, allowing them to give inputs into draft legislation, and uh, it's 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 been quite interesting to see the engagement from citizens online where the level of trust is also much greater in terms of their in terms of going through an organization like civis and feeling like they're being heard a lot better so you know there are organizations like civis we also had nyaya in the session before us which is trying to again build a bridge between the legal space as well as individuals trying to understand the law and also trying to articulate their needs um and and there is of course an offline component to some of these things so in both civis and nyaya's case you know what's interesting is how there is an the online is being paired with the offline to kind of complete that ecosystem um uh, you know there, there's another instance if we look at the work of jhatka as well so jhatka sort of is trying to create a lot of you know jhatka is trying to sort of not be the actor and be more of the glue where it's bringing a lot of information and experts in touch with citizens who might have a certain passion for an issue they're trying to raise concerns and in, in the process of that work, they're doing a lot of work with data on pollution and raising some of those um, energies. And I think that it's a really great pairing, you know, on the kind of uh, government data, which is collected by government and public data, which is actually provided and crowdsourced by people. So I think there's an interesting marriage to be talked of there as well in terms of how does the data that government collect become a lot more crowdsourced, of course, authenticated, valuable, and then downstreamed as well to the individuals who then have to can make meaning with that data. And also, you know, so accountability flows both ways in some sense. It's very aspirational. Yes, I think we're, we're sort of at this point, the struggle really is in, in even having good government data. But I think that there is something to be thought of in terms of uh, expanding the imagination on what data in this space could look like as well. Thank you. Thank you, Natasha. Samit, there's a question on uh, technology. I thought you'd be best place to respond to. Uh, how do you think of funding digital commons? Uh, and, and kind of what's the best route of funding uh, for a you know, digital commons? Uh, the best route we are still figuring out, to be honest. Uh, we are looking at uh, various models that exist today. Um, there, there ha you know the, the the need for not just digital comms like uh, Natasha was saying it has to go downstream as well because how does it one, one very important component is how does it how does it uh, reach the last change maker in the village right who's not necessarily looking at a Wikipedia like interface or uh, a search engine all the time. Right, so there's also that, but yeah, uh, essentially we need to put out all the great learnings. You know, we need to create playbooks from everywhere, and actionable playbooks. So uh, we are actually committed to investing into that. We are already started uh, doing that. We have to make it look like the mainstream, is what I keep saying. Right? I mean, it's 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 the the combined set of actors, actions, uh, even outcomes to a certain extent that have already happened. 
is actually much bank, larger than the Bangdo startup ecosystem, for instance. But it it feels much smaller because it doesn't it doesn't appear like the mainstream. It you know there's almost like a very hard desire to appear like this amazing fringe, if you understand what I mean, right? So, uh, w w what does it have? It, it there are there are uh, careers in it, jobs in it. There is uh, funding in it. There is uh, uh, you know, knowledge systems that are available to everybody at various levels. There are uh, physical and uh, online events like this that happen that also bring in a wider diversity of uh, actors into the same space. So all of this will need a lot of different platforms. So we are we are insisting, and I think um, Natasha's team is also doing that, and we've learned from them uh, that uh, everything that needs to happen in the public in a in a public commons way, whether it's open source software, we are trying to encourage uh, uh, people we are partnering with to bring their software out into open source, right? And we're we're trying to work with Foss United to see if we can get that funded. Right, we, we, if we can find volunteers to do that, uh, we would we would love to actually partner on uh, the uh, analytics platform that you're creating, Bharat. Right, uh, this. So what's what's also required to develop now is the ability to work with sparse data, because you're not going to have you know uh, something that fits a common schema. You're not going to have rich data everywhere equally. There's one organization collect which has actually mapped 500 different villages for soil carbon and similar attributes. Right, you may not have it everywhere else, but that's not good enough reason to not start. Right. So similarly for water assessment, similarly for we are trying to create uh, the idea of uh, mapping ecological wealth for all the 750 bioregions of India, because you cannot create strong localized economies unless you understand what your wealth is. You know, the people who understand their wealth can engage with it and can think of solutions around it. So. Uh, so this, all of this needs to be captured. So uh, I think a lot more is needed. Uh, we, are, we are trying to find ways to keep it even outside rain matter in a, in a completely public commons kind of uh, way. We, we need to figure out what consortiums can be created and how, how it can be truly open. Um, still early days, but I think a lot needs to be done. Tarun, if I can just add something on that. You know, sure, one uh, way we've been thinking about this digital commons piece uh, and links to funding is that if you think about digital common and you use uh, to use a Bangalore analogy, if you think of a stack, yeah, the technology uh, layer, right? But there are two other equally important layers. There's a governance layer, yeah, and there's a community engagement layer. And uh, I would argue that today India is like a world leader in terms of thinking about the technology layer. We have some of the most impressive things, starting out with Aadhaar, India Stack. Now, a very interesting place like the National Digital Health Mission, yeah. the, uh, Diksha, and all of these other things, right? So I think they're um, fabulous stuff. But we, uh, we have work to do on both the governance layer and the community engagement layer. Yeah. Governance layer are the rules of the game, the uh, institutional ownership, the accountability, yeah. the issues of data privacy. Yeah. All of these things I would put in the governance layer. And the community engagement layer, of course, very familiar to people in this group, but Things like public consultation, uh, making sure that uh, processes are followed when you're when you're doing these, but also building a community of innovators who will build on yes. top of digital commons, which yes. actually often gets ignored if you take a tech tech first tech first lens. Yeah, yeah. So really, what we've been saying is, um, funders, philanthropic funders, can come in and support the strengthening of the yeah. governance and the community engagement layers, because on the technology layer of digital commons, you know the the story is uh, already shaping up to be quite quite good so uh out here in bangdo we have instances of both happening you know uh, the force community does it a certain way the free and open source community the folks at open street maps and there are a bunch of open data platforms who have a certain uh view of how community rules work and they have some precedents as well uh on the engagement side i think it's got to be ground up so what we're trying to do is uh if something has to go open source uh are there three more adopters for it right off the bat? So you're taking a slightly product management approach to this. Uh, I think I think uh, I think a, a deeper, wider conversation on this is very very necessary, and would love to connect with you on that. Bharat. Thank you, Samir and Bharat, for that. Um, 
So I'll take one last question. I'll take kind of the liberty of uh, the facilitator we told to, uh, uh, you know, iterate it a little bit. Uh, so now Nikhil's second question is around the relationship between state and capital. Uh, you know, he's asking a specific example of, you know, is it possible to imagine private capital uh, in aiding civic engagement and political participation? Uh, what to your point around imagining a 2.0 version of urban local body participation? So that is coming to mind as traditionally, Kind of the levels of voter turnout are uh, kind of low uh, relative to other uh, voter turnouts in general assembly and state elections. So, can we uh, one broader question is uh, you know for each of you uh, like what is your vision to kind of uh, you know liberalize some of the uh, you know conditions of how you know capital is invested uh, in uh, the active citizenship space uh, and there are kind of certain restraints around where it can be invested not invested. Uh, like in US, for example, get out to vote uh, is uh, a fairly, uh, you know, popular, uh, you know, space of investment. Um, so, so yeah, that, that was one. And secondly, very specifically to some of the visions that you had shared, like say, if you had to imagine a 2.0 vision for urban local bodies, uh, what is the scope for capital uh, in, in investing in, uh, you know, uh, promoting 72nd and 73rd, uh, uh, you know, amendments or implementation of 72nd and Seventy-third amendments. Natasha, do you want to go first? Or? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure I entirely understand the question, Tarun, but um, I think in terms of local kind of local governance uh, our thinking around local governance and, and perhaps capitalization of that really lies in in a lot of sort of external factors for instance you know what is the level of decentralization what is the level of funds available um i think here again we sort of lead from the more kind of community angle in terms of there has to be problem solving at a very hyper local level there have to be networks and coalitions of both information as well as um solutions that are happening uh, very dynamically. I think the funding on this side, I, I think perhaps, uh, you know, I'm circling back to what I said earlier is that we have realized that just kind of seeding the space and allowing actions to just keep happening is is somewhere that is, is the approach that we're taking, which is, you know, that things will eventually spontaneously come together at some point, but it's really important to kind of nurture the actions and the interactions as they're happening so that and, and that's that's there at the local level um i wouldn't necessarily comment on you know the 76th amendment i think that issue is actually complicated because there is the whole element of sort of district administration that comes into the ability for the panchayati raj system to be empowered and it's really i'm not the expert on that at all um having said i mean i think that at the yeah at, at the kind of um, at the village level, the approach there as well in, in some of the partnerships that we have, for instance, is around empowerment. And we feel that empowerment as a uh, pathway for emergent political leadership is, 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 is a good way to go. Um, we have seen that in some of our programs as well, that uh, once you empower a, a, a group of people, a certain percentage of them do assert themselves and sort of realize that they're the kind of uh, realize their potential politically and and perhaps that's and the third and last thing i just want to quickly say um is around c c ensuring diversity so when it comes to sort of any kind of um, funding or any kind of uh, leverage that all of us want to have i think collaboration going in it together so diversity on the funding side diversity on the implementation side is really important but yeah um, what if you want yeah, to yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I think I, mean, I also not fully understood the question, but let me just say two things. One is that the way we look at the funding on uh, this space is not, not different from the funding in other spaces, which is to say we are looking for bold entrepreneurs who are trying to help solve the problem, right? So in the active citizenship, we're looking for bold, you know, like in, uh, in our tech for impact, uh, for-profit investing, we look for bold entrepreneurs. And similarly, we're looking for bold entrepreneurs who are trying to solve the problem of citizen engagement and there are some exemplars in our country, right? There's Janagraha, there is a Foundation for Ecological Security. I would argue even e-government foundation is, would fall in that category, even though they, they take a tech lens uh, and so on. So I think that is, um, that is, that is very, very critical 
to the way one should think about deploying capital on this on this agenda the second thing i would say specifically on you know the for profit uh, investments in this space i would say that is a fledgling space i think a lot of efforts have been made in the past uh but there is a there it's a lot of complexities uh around ability and willingness to pay and so on and so forth there have been efforts around i think incubators around civic tech and 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 so on which have met with limited limited success so far but again that's an area that we are very interested to continue uh, supporting there's an there's an entity within iim ahmedabad called ciie center for innovation and entrepreneurship where we have recently supported a program to fund um entrepreneurship in three spaces which are, which are uh, under invested which are uh, property tech uh, legal tech and civic tech and the idea really is that recognizing there aren't any ready to invest for profit opportunities in these spaces what are the set of things that entrepreneurs would need to make them um you know um investable um in the conventional sense uh, operations in the near future thanks thanks for it that makes sense uh, we are at the hour mark so uh, you know uh, we will quickly bring this to a close uh, uh, with uh, you no know, quick word of advice that you have for you know bold uh, founders and entrepreneurs out there uh, so if you could get a bite from each one of you like you know what do you have a uh, what is your advice for uh, you know funders and aspiring social entrepreneurs out there samir maybe you want to get us started um what we been asking for is uh, folks to be a little audacious uh, we can't afford to tinker at the edges anymore uh, we are taking the focus away from uh, small project goals to directional goals and uh, longer term goals i mean not not going to put a time frame to it um, so so we're trying to figure out how do we start measuring how the needle is moved rather than how the project goals are achieved right uh so people can think audaciously experiment pivot quickly uh you know leave space for ground up discovery of solutions and so on and so forth so we would like to see more of it i i do understand that uh uh it's it's not the habit by and large and there, there is it's it's not it's not uh it's not how things are measured uh, across across the space so we might be just complicating their lives for now but what the Natasha yeah um i think for us i think what's really valuable is to to uh, partner with people who understand very clearly the angle with which they are addressing an issue but also recognize that there is a larger system dynamic and are interested and curious to understand the larger systemic vectors that come into place so i think that kind of i suppose curiosity is what we really sort of uh, hope people will hold on to uh, so yeah um since i have the last word three quick things one be bold i think samir has already talked about that uh, time for um, and, and i think a lot of funders look for that i think as both samir and natasha said second is uh, think hard about positioning and storytelling i think the uh, people in this space have a lot of work to do on that we said this is a difficult space as far as that is concerned and third uh, demonstrate leverage right either around uh, how you are going to leverage the energy of communities to solve the problem or how are you going to leverage the government system to help solve the problem i think people uh, funders especially appreciate uh, you bringing that lens uh, into into that discussion so boldness uh, storytelling and uh, leverage would be my three uh, three takeaways awesome on on that note uh, you no know, i had a great time learning and listening from uh, all of you i hope kind of the audience had a great time as well uh, Yeah, I, I hope we don't need this discussion uh, in 25 years from now. And then, like Sami said, maybe in 10 years from now, we can convene back uh, to kind of celebrate some of the successes we achieve in in the next decade of you know motivated active active citizenship. Uh, but thanks a lot. This was very uh, personally enriching. Back to you, Yash. Thank you.
thank you so much to all the guests for such an insightful discussion i think this was an amazing session to close out the day for the resilient societies track however we will be back tomorrow at 11 am with the session uncommon ground where our speakers will try to discuss paths towards greater coexistence between a strong society and a strong state finally we close out the resilient societies track tomorrow with our last session charcha pe charcha at 12 pm which is going to be a playful and dynamic conversation between the founders in the roini nilikali philanthropies active citizenship portfolio so do do tune in tomorrow as well and with that i'd like to thank everyone for being with us today we hope to see you again tomorrow and have a nice evening everyone thank you thanks bye thank you